welcome. Um, tonight is the third in a three-part series on holiday imagery. We started in March with um, a wonderful image from a Haggadah. Um, is that Haggadah? Yeah. Haggadah, sorry. <laughs> um, with this drooping, dramatic, dead pe peacock on it. And that was <laughs> lots of fun. And then um, just last month, we did Thanksgiving. And, and here we are on Christmas iconography. Um, so tonight is um, um, Julie Harris once more. I think you all know her, but I'm going to make you listen to her qualifications anyway, because she is such an interesting person. She's an art historian, Glencoe resident, and a specialist in the art of medieval Iberia, who has taught art history at Northwestern University and Skidmore College, among others. She was recently awarded a Center for Spain in America fellowship at the Clark Institute in Williamstown, Massachusetts, for her project on the decorative carpet pages of Iberian Hebrew Bibles. Her publications have been um, have appeared in numerous academic journals, and she's also part of an international team of scholars researching medieval treasures in Spain. She did a series of art discussions called Mirror Images for us in, in 2022, and it's very nice to have you back, Julie. Just this morning, she was this morning, she did a program for people around the world. Last week, yeah. In, in Israel based in Israel, but people all around the world. Right. Um, so we're lucky to have her. <laughs> well, I'm lucky to have Zoom. So I can talk to all sorts of people. <laughs> Thank you for coming. So I got a little fancy with the red and the, uh, the red and green. I can't have the next slide. So I decided I would do be take the liberties of really doing the art history toolbox today. Um, and talk about what are some of the things that our historians do, because we're gonna look at a few traditional images that uh, became associated with Christmas. And of course, art historians, most people think art historians just work on style so that they're doing what we call connoisseurship. So they're saying, well, is it a Rembrandt or is it a student of Rembrandt? Is it real or is it a forgery? And there are still people who do that. Or how early was the manuscript made? Well, I don't know looking at the way they do the drapery, I'd say it's early 1300 and that somebody would say, no, 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 it's certainly later in the 14th century. Uh, yeah, style is part of our toolbox. The other thing that's part of our toolbox is what's called iconography. And if you're interested in words, you probably recognize the word icon and graph, so like, or grapheme. So it really is um, looking at images, the icon as an image and graph as writing or symbolism so the traditional or conventional Im images or symbols associated with a subject, especially a religious or legendary subject. So you can call this lecture something like the iconography of Christmas, um, knowing that Christmas has just, it's an immense topic. I couldn't, it's much, much bigger than Thanksgiving as a topic, it's a huge topic. So we're gonna look at the iconography rather than the style. You feel free to note the style of things, but, that's not going to be my primary uh, focus. Can I have the next one? All right. So we think about what's Christmas imagery? What are the things that we associate with Christmas? People, pictures of people, pictures. What colors? Well, red and green, right? Uh, now it's blue. Blue and white. We see a lot of sort of wintry silver colors as well. Um, what are these things commonly associated with Christmas? What is the iconography of Christmas and how do we analyze the images that we see like an art, as an art historian would? What did we, how can we be scientifically art historical as we look at it? So long time ago, uh, when art history first came to America, it came with refugees from the Nazis and one of the great refugees was Erwin Panofsky, and Panofsky wrote a lot about how to be an iconographer, um, and he sort of laid it out in a, long, a number of long essays, which people have critiqued, um, but he said there's a method, and one of the methods is first to look at pre-iconographic, so primary or natural subject matter. For example, a mother and a child in a barn-like structure, starts sounding familiar, right? or a round man dressed in red driving a sleigh. So you're just looking at something and you're not making any judgments about it. You're saying, well, what is it that I'm seeing? And then the convention and precedent, the iconography of it would have us understand that what we're seeing with the mother and child in a barn-like structure is actually the nativity. We see how it is depicted in medieval manuscripts and our historians will say, well, they do it this way 
here. They do it this way there. They do it this way at this time, but they don't do it this way at that time. So how the depiction of this particular scene evolved over time, who was included in it, where it was set, how were the people, the characters dressed. Um, and people critique Panofsky and some of these early uh, practitioners of iconography with privileging, with really emphasizing a textual source for everything. Everything is a text. And I think it's a little naive the way to say that of Panofsky because he's a, he was brilliant. But yes, they are always looking for text-driven readings because if you work on biblical art, you generally have a text, it's the Bible. But as we're about to see, sometimes it doesn't line up the way we think it's going to. So I'll take the next uh, structure. So let's talk about Christian art altogether in the beginning. So the steps of the iconographic approach would be pre-iconographic, which we just talked about, like a mom with a baby in a barn. So the natural subject matter, convention and precedent, meaning the iconography. And then there's a third part. To me, the third part is the most fascinating. Today, we would probably call this reception. So how are all these things understood in a particular area? And how does that, knowing that it's going to be in a particular area, how does that change our reading? Uh, so you're uncovering the intrinsic meaning, the iconology. So you, by doing this, and I know I'm talking really fast, but what you read is in a way, you're, you're putting yourself in the minds of the viewer, not necessarily of the creator, but of the viewer. And that's what more trendy art history is doing. Like most people are very interested in the reception and less interested in finding a textual source. But we don't care about that. We're just gonna try to wrench all the meaning we can out of everything we're looking at today. And, and I'm going to just show some interesting things. So let's say we're, we stumble upon this image and what do you see? A fish. And what do we see behind the fish? It's a little hard to tell what that is. Well, it's actually a basket with bread in it, loaves. It looks like a, to me now it looks like scrolls, but it's not. So it's a fish, a loaf and a fish. Could we have the next one? And so it might help if I tell you that this was in a catacomb, the catacomb of Calixtinus. And so I, I used to teach this image all the time as sort of how the very beginnings of Christian art work. Remember, when Christians started doing art, they, like the Jews, who they came from, had this problem called not making graven images. So they really were very hesitant about making images that could conceivably become idols that people would worship. So in the very, very beginning, we don't have images of the mother and child being Jesus and Mary. We just don't. And in fact, we don't have that many images at all. We don't have much until 200, 300 when we start having catacomb images. And these images are almost like codes. The way we read them is almost a code. And the only person who would really understand the code would be a Christian. So the loaves and the fishes, well, gee, someone who's trained in Bible would know about the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. They might also know the notion of Jesus as, or Christ as a fisherman, the fisher of men's souls, right? They might also know ictus in Greek, the letters stand for Jesus Christ, God's son, savior. So we, we're decoding all of this stuff and all you're seeing is a fish and some bread. So for the uninitiated, this would just be a fish and some bread, like they would see on a Roman wall painting. But for the initiated, because, and especially initiated in a scene of, in a catacomb, which is where people are buried, it then, you can take it one step further and say, oh, savior, if I'm a believer, I will be born again because I'm a believer. So a simple picture can be very, very complicated. So we see what we see naturally. We see maybe a reference to something in the gospel. We may see even another meaning that has to do with the Greek word and how and how it can be abbreviated or how it can, how its abbreviation could be understood. Then we take one step further. What does it mean to me if I'm a member of this at that point, just beginning religion? Okay, so what does this have to do with Christmas? Not much. Next, <laughs> I want to just point out that once they began to make images in the Christian world, they also borrowed a lot from the classical world because they were surrounded by pagan art. 
But the idea was to make the pagan art Christian. And this really happened after Christianity was no longer threatened by paganism. So after Constantine, we're talking about the fourth and fifth century. And one image that gets, I'm just bringing it in, I could bring many, but one is Christ as the good shepherd. So the calf bearer on the left of a shepherd with the, the calf, you know, the injured calf or the small calf around his neck gets adopted to be an image of Jesus Christ as the good shepherd. Notice he doesn't have a beard in this image. Mostly in the early Christian world, he's not shown with a beard. He's shown as a youth. So I'm just showing how one religion or one society adopts the art of the other. So the iconography here and style are sort of, it's very interesting because they're inheriting something and it's becoming interpreted in another way over time. Okay, I'll take the next slide. So here, if you remember, well, you weren't here last time, but let me recap my main point, which is if you want to study art history, you always ask, I mean, it's not just art history, but it works for art history very well. What do we have? So what do we have for material remains? What do we have? Meaning, what do we have for primary sources? And the last one is, what do we say about what we have? <laughs> Which is legends or historiography. Historiography is the study of history. So what narratives have people made up? What stories have they made up? Or how have they understood all of these things together? What we have what we have is in primary sources, what we have in material remains, and what do we have as a history of interpretation. So iconology is how iconography is understood by an individual, a group, et cetera, living in a place, period, or culture, so reception. So I just kind of went through that. So now we're all ready. We've had, uh, we got our PhDs in art history in five minutes, mm -hmm. and we can start looking at some images. Okay, so what do we have? Well, do we have any physical material remains of Christmas? Do we have any bodily remains, any images of Jesus? Well, not really. Later, we start to have legends about, for instance, the Shroud of Turin is a reflection of the notion of the Sudarium of Veronica. So she wipes Christ's face and his face is imprinted on the, the veil. So, but this doesn't, it, it doesn't date back to those days. I'll take the next one. We don't have, do we have any bodily remains of the Virgin? Well, anyone had, has anyone been to Chartres? There was supposed to be a little piece of what her veil that was, yeah, her girdle, they call it the linen, a piece of linen. But we don't because she was, she had an assumption. She was taken bodily straight up to heaven. So she didn't leave anything behind. So, I mean, there, you know, you can argue about relics of this, relics of that. But the only thing we have is this tradition, however, which appears much later, of St. Luke painting the Virgin. And here we have Roger van der Weyden showing St. Luke painting the Virgin. Did St. Luke really paint the Virgin? Probably not. But that provides verification for the images of the Virgin. And, and so each image then becomes copied because it has the sense that it's verified. In the case of Veronica, the Sudarium were... Jesus's face is implanted on it. It's considered an akiropoeta, which is a, an image not made by human hands. It's just made divinely. So that's how the Byzantine world kind of got past some of their reluctance about having icons by saying, well, that's an image not made by human hands. So God sanctioned that image. So these ideas work together to allow this faith that's really not supposed to have, you know, they're a little uncomfortable about images. And Martin Luther has a lot to say about that and later on in history to allow them to have traditions of religious imagery that have some sense of authority. I'll take the next one. Oh, so what do we have for sources? Well, Luke is one of our best, is really our best source in the, um, only, only two of the gospels talk about the nativity, Jesus's birth, which is what we're talking about Christmas. But Luke provides the most information. The Gospels were written probably in the 70s, 40, 50 years after the crucifixion. And this is what Luke says. He doesn't really tell us a lot. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, all the world should be registered. So that's about the going to Hebron to have the census and uh, or Bethlehem. And then uh, he explains that... Uh, Joseph goes 
to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, and there's all kinds of controversy about how you translate that, who was with child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for him for them at the end. That's the information that we have. There's really not much more. So let's see what happens with the text uh, and the images. Next one. Okay. Oh, well, guess what? In the eighth or ninth century, people add to the story a bit. And this starts to influence the art. It seems to me, I was just thinking about this the other day. Nobody ever, if you ever play telephone with people or tell a story with someone, no one ever shortens a story. They always embellish a story. People, because people crave details. People crave details. And so now the gospel of pseudo-Matthew, meaning it wasn't really Matthew's gospel, written in the 8th or ninth century, so we're talking about the Carolingian age and Antonian age, we have a little bit more information. Well, first of all, Mary is coming off of an animal. Oh, so she's on an animal, probably like a donkey, right? And she goes into a recess under a cavern. Whoa, first thing time I'm hearing about this, a cavern in which there never was light, but all was darkness. Um, and the Blessed Mary got into it. It began to shine with the brightness as if it were the sixth hour of the day, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and she brought forth a son there and the angels surrounded him, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so now we have a little bit more information. I have one more slide with text. The golden legend, of course, Jacobo de Voragine, wildly popular, spread all over the place, especially in the mid 13th and 14th century when people really began to crave sort of personal relationship with God, more human qualities of God, rather than just this divine judge who was way up in the heavens. Um, so, and you see this in the art as well. So, and when they were come thither because the hostelries, hostelries were all taken up, they were constrained to be without in a common place where all people went, ah, and there was a stable for an ass that he brought with him and for an ox. In that night, our blessed lady and mother of God was delivered our blessed savior upon the hay that lay in the rack. Notice like I really emphasized all these little details that get stuck in. Okay, now I think we finally have some pictures. Ah, so what we have is the Scrovani Chapel in Padua. Has anybody been there? Oh, well, you need to go right away. It's amazing. <laughs> It's Giotto, one of our first proto-Renaissance artists. Some people call him the first Renaissance artist. It depends which book, survey book you read, whether he's in the end of medieval or the beginning of the Renaissance. And where, where does he, what's he doing? He's obviously not just reading Luke. He's added some information. Is she in a barn or is she in a cave? Um, maybe a barn. We do have... Our two friends, right? The ass and ox. So he's seen uh, the Jacopo de Voragine, and we have the angels, right? So he, his iconography here of the nativity, which is of course like our primo Christmas image, is the nativity, is uh, influenced by some of these later texts that expand upon what the gospel tells us. The other thing that's great about it is that Giotto, and this is what makes him, a, you know, the most magnificent painter of his age, is that he uses the new found techniques of three dimensions and a perspective to make the scene very human, very solid. The emotions between people, the way they gaze, Mary gazes at the child, the relationship between people in the emotions even if the angels and people gazing up at the angels, it's also vivid and it plays right into this desire of people to really experience human emotions when they're studying religious history. All right, so Giotto's nativity, I have another one. So- this last one painted on metal? No, this last one is frescoes. Okay. So the arena chapel was um, commissioned by a banker whose name was Enrico Scrovani. And Enrico Scrivani's father was mentioned in Dante for having been a usurer. So he was a banker who lent money. And so Scrivani's, the son, Enrico, was very concerned about his soul. 
because he knew that it came from dirty money. It really even wasn't dirty, but the church thought usury was wrong and he was still doing it. So he commissioned next to this palace area, this incredible chapel and you can visit it. And it's this barrel vault. It's just a high narrow building and the whole wall is a spiral of the nativity story. Well, it actually starts with the grandparents. <laughs> it goes all the way through, and then they have a crucifixion and the last judgment. And so it's four levels of fresco. And the ceiling is this unearthly blue. It's just the most celestial blue. And Enrico is, is there, and he donates this for his soul. So that's what this is. But the nativity was there first. So, which brings us to the question of patron, which I wanted to mention in here too. So the other great, the nativity is like the primo scene, right? If you had to name a Christmas scene, that's what's on your Christmas cards. If you sent a religious card, probably the nativity. The other would be the adoration of the magic. And which is sourced in Matthew. But we have so much going on here. And this would be Gentili de Fabriano, again, for a patron. So we can talk not just of what we're looking at, which is that the three wise men following a star, you see them in the distance with their gold halos coming around. And here they come through or see the baby, the mother and the baby. So we start to see some things that are repeated many times in similar images. The virgin in blue, that celestial blue color is always repeated. And there are many, lots of writing about why blue and, but it becomes a type. So if you're gonna do the virgin and child, she's gonna have blue, she's gonna have a halo. So they all have halos, rounded halos, the sainted ones. Uh, the magi are coming from a distance. So in order to show them as exotics, we start to have a black magus, not in this one, but we have people who are wearing interesting costumes and exotic costumes and of course trappings are exotic and they have exotic animals with them. Sometimes I think there's a monkey up there and, uh, and uh, this fellow, there's a monkey above him and then there's him and he's believed to be the patron here uh, near the Falcon and his last name, I think it's like Sprotea or something is related to the word for Falcon. And this piece would have been set up as an altarpiece for his devotion. And so we see not only an iconography that is established, the nativity comes from the Bible, but the details of it relate to the time it's made, which if he's looking at it. So it's made for a very wealthy man. It's made in a time where there's lots of gold. Uh, there's made in a time where people are aware of the exotic world beyond Europe, and they're made their kind of referencing this in the writing. The, this guy has a pseudo Arabic on his, he's a sword bearer and he's got pseudo Arabic. We got somebody having their uh, um, spurs taken off. So this is about wealth. It's about um, people who were looking at their reception would be, oh yes, it's a religious scene, but it's also about how wealthy the patronage is. Um, and I'm just doing a very, very quick example because we, we're going to move on to some other ideas so uh, that's the other uh, you know if you want to talk about a great iconic moments would be adoration of the magi in christian art would be what we would consider christmas iconography i'll take the next one okay so do we want to go through this i think we mentioned that okay we can go through this oh uh, the other would be the annunciation don't really i think i want to move on to American stuff, oh, but I do want to say this. Okay, so the Annunciation would be the, you know, what precipitated all of this. So we start to think about um, the how Christ was conceived. I just want to show you this because it's very, very clever. This is the Annunciation in the National Gallery. Um, can we go back to the one so we can look at the text? And there, do I see this? The no. I don't have the Latin on this one. Okay, and next, keep going and then go back to the, the next one. There, okay, so one, go one ahead. Ah, here we go. So, uh, if you know the gospel, the angel comes in and says unto her, uh, Mary, hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. So, awe uh, gratia plena dominus tecum benedicta in tumulieribus. So he's 
greeting, the archangel's coming in and greeting Mary, and Mary says, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, uh, Eke Antila, or Anshila, Domini, Viabi, Secundum Verbum Tuum, let it be done to me according to, she had seized, she said, Yes, let it be done to me according to thy word. So here is the beautiful, you don't know if it's male or female because angels are androgynous, right? Say, greeting Mary, and she answers upside down because who's reading it? God's reading it. This, I mean, Yad and I is just a genius, right? So this is in Washington, D.C. Yeah, it's not like he didn't know how to write. No, he said, he, she is speaking, the angel, he, he, she, is speaking to Mary, but who's Mary speaking to? To God. So, okay, I'm chilling, don't me. This, so that's a, that's a, uh, that's a classic, right? <laughs> it's something different. And in, in, in addition to that, all the incredible details, the, the light off, reflecting off the gems, the hair, the skin. I mean, Jan Van Eyck, the, the bottle, the windows, um, magnificent. But he adds that little touch. So he's aware of the source, and he's also aware of how we would understand the source coming out of the angel's mouth and coming out of the virgin's mouth. Okay, now we can now we can move on. So those were the sort of the classic iconographies. We have some other takes on these iconographies, though. The census of Bethlehem. If you saw this, you would say it's a snow scene, right? Just a snow scene somewhere in the north, but it's really the census. And if you look very carefully, there's the virgin coming in to the census, and you know when she goes, there's no room for her to stay, and that's when she gives birth. So that's Bruegel's census at Bethlehem. I'll take another, the next one. Another, here's a scene that's devout, that's religious, but it really doesn't have a biblical source. You have to look really carefully. You see a church in the background, and you see a man throwing away his crutches. He's seated here under a crucifixion. Is it a vision, or is he come upon a statue of the crucifixion, unclear, most likely he's having a vision and he's healed and he's already praying for healing and he's throwing his crutch away. So in this case, like this romantic wintry landscape becomes the means by which this religious story is told. And you, I'm sure this is on numerous Christmas cards, even though it's not explicitly about Christmas. Next one. Now we come to Christmas in America. <laughs> So we've seen sort of this hardcore art history. Okay, we can relax now and talk about, well, what happens in America? It was like 2015 or so, was it, when uh, Starbucks came out with these red cups and people went, some people went crazy because they said, well, we're not allowed to say Merry Christmas anymore and there's a war on Christmas. Okay, even though they're red and green and she's got a star on top of her head, but whatever. So we'll take the next one. And what made me laugh so hard is because the same people who were saying that, who talk about our American heritage, don't want to admit that the Puritans who founded this, theoretically founded this country, for instance, Plymouth, which we talked about in um, our last talk, they didn't believe in Christmas. In fact, Christmas in the Puritan governor in Massachusetts made Christmas illegal. And we actually have in our rare text of Plymouth Plantation, um, the, the head of Plymouth, uh, Bradford, saying to a couple people who were not separatists, who just happened to be on the Mayflower with the rest, saying, well, why aren't you working today? And he's, you know, why aren't you farming and doing everything that everybody else is doing? He said, well, it's Christmas. He said, no, 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 we don't celebrate Christmas. Now, why did the Puritans not celebrate Christmas? There are several reasons. Number one is because they were looking for the text and there's no biblical text that tells you when Christmas happened. That says December 25th. That's something that was decided much later as a date and it's more complicated. So it was not a biblically sanctioned holiday. It's not like the Sabbath. The Sabbath for them was huge. Um, they also associated Christmas with misrule. Because back in England, Christmas was a day that youth would go out and go berserk. Also Thanksgiving, but mostly Christmas, that they would play games and they would get drunk and they would make a world turned upside down, a mundus inversus. So the working people would, would you know, the servants would insult their masters or they would go to just 
up to all sorts of mischief. And the Puritans didn't like that kind of mischief. They also didn't like Catholicism. So anything associated with the saints and Catholicism was not um, something that they wanted to, to be involved with. They said, we don't know when Jesus's birthday was. It's not a holiday for us. It's just a day like any other. So they're even, you know, I mean, this painting is done in 1883 when the country was sort of obsessed with what the pilgrims were like. And one thing that we have is this painting of the, the Puritans saying, nope, there's no, I think they're at a tavern. Stop it. This is, there's no Christmas. That means, you, you know, you're not going to get drunk and you're not going to run around and cause trouble. I'll take the next one. In fact, we even have images. And again, these are later. These are from magazines and things like weekly magazines. But here's the Puritans a Puritan rebuking children for picking holly because holly was like a pagan thing. And we don't want to, we don't, that's not the proper way to, to worship. So America, when it was, if you want to call that America, 17th century colonial America before uh, the revolution was not keen. The British Puritans were not keen on Christmas. It was not a holiday. In fact, at some point it was illegal, although gradually things change. I'll take the next one. And one of the, so we have to think about American history. What well, wasn't just British people who came here? We start to have German immigration. We start to have Scandinavian immigration. We start to have immigration from France, from other places who don't have the same Puritan uh, feel, feelings as the Puritans do and have their own Christmas tradition. But really, Christmas was not the big deal in early America that it is today. And until a certain time, things start to change and we start to have, especially in the American South, um, British, more British uh, Anglican immigrants. So not Puritans, but those who were with the normal Anglican church. And we start to have more people coming from other places and they start to think about Christmas and we start to uh, conceptualize a holiday that is centered on the home that is religious, that is whose um, who's, uh, uh, who, who's trappings are not those of young men running out and getting drunk. Like how can we civilize Christmas and have a nice family Christmas? And one of the things that catches people's eyes are the way Victoria and Albert celebrate Christmas. Now, Albert, as you know, was German. So Victoria was British and so the families joined. and that's when the Christmas tree enters the picture. So the Christmas tree is a German thing. So we have Americans and British celebrating Christmas in a German way. And that kind of comes to America. The thing that's different though, is when the Christmas tree starts, it's on the table. It's not on the floor. It's something you put on your table. And there's a whole series of things in the, that, are precede, that precede the Christmas tree that are for displaying on a table. So your fine salt cellar, your fine candelabra. So the whole Northern cities, wealthy bourgeois, urban Germanic cities, because there was really no Germany quite yet, had these material, this material culture of wealth where they had silver objects and things for people to see on their tables when they you would entertain. And that's how the Christmas tree, the Christmas tree is on the table for many, many years. And the presents are hanging from the tree, not under the tree, but their presents are hanging on the tree. So this illustrated London Times image of Victoria and Albert with their Christmas tree and their little kids and everyone dressed up and in the home. And look, he's looking lovingly down at the child and it becomes a domestic, civilized holiday instead of a holiday of ruffians drunk in the street really appeals to America. So if I have the next one, and it's this image starts to be repeated, for example, in Godey's Lady Book, Ladies Book, which was kind of like the Martha Stewart's magazine of its time. Um, and it shows the taste for English things, which are really German in origin. But that same image more or less appears in the Godey's Ladies Book. And Godey's Ladies Book was also a place where people were advocating for the celebration of Thanksgiving as a national holiday, a domestic holiday to bring the country together during the Civil War. And there's a Civil War element in the celebration of Christmas as well. I'll take the next one. Okay, so how did all everybody get so involved in this and how did it have such a British flavor? Well, 
there are a lot of people involved. I didn't realize how many people were involved in this. But Washington Irving, believe it or not, he's also wrote Tales of the Alhambra. He, was, he did a lot of things that changed people's view of places. But anyway, he wrote this book called The Sketch, Sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon, published in 1820 in book form. And he describes in his book, and I have not read this yet, uh, the old with the ye old with an E, ye old Christmas at Bracebridge Hall in rural England. And he claims that this is based on his, what he saw and that this is a place in rural England in a in big manor house with servants and a crackling fire and all of that. And this was really the way Christmas was supposed to be. And that this is the tradition that we should take up and about 1820 or so. And it's all really his description is mostly about the food. So the, the what they drank and what they ate and you know the groaning board and all of this stuff and how much food there was. So Washington Irving's description was very, very influential in the United States. I'll take the next one. The other one, of course, no surprise, is Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And I had no idea that Dickens himself toured America. People waited in line for hours and hours and hours to get tickets to see him read A Christmas Carol live. I, I just had no idea. But he did this. And The Christmas Carol was tremendously influential to Americans. And people, you know, people wept. They they would they became were overcome at his readings and it was also performed and so Dickens and Dickens became you know uh, really well known through A Christmas Carol and that introduced America to this vision of Christmas as it was understood in Britain and also with this different slant to it not so much about the food and the fantastic. Uh, you know, small town manor house, like a Downton Abbey, but instead rural poverty or, I mean, uh, urban poverty and the kind of life that many Americans were living, working in mills or working in towns and in factories and things like that. And it, with a strong emphasis on Christmas as a time that you isn't just for the family, but it's a time to give to people who are less fortunate. And that's really the message of the Christmas Carol. And that's becomes very influential to the way Christmas is understood in America. So I can take some more things. So that's why we have so much ye old. I mean, when we still have it today, you'll have carols on the corner, sometimes in Glencoe, dressed in these outfits. Well, Christmas was celebrated all over the world, Christian world, but it is because of the influence of Dickens and Christmas Carol, not only because people emigrated from England, but people were emigrating from elsewhere, but that image from Cratchit and and the Christmas Carol and Dickens became very, very influential to the way Christmas is represented, even to this day. Um, take another one. Um, and even Norman Rockwell starts to show uh, these images that are the coaches of Victorian England, people traveling by coach to get home. In the Thanksgiving talk, we looked at Dury's painting, Home for Thanksgiving, which was reproduced by Courier and Ives, and everyone remembers what that, you know, that's a very iconic people coming home to a farmstead. Same idea with Christmas is that we are now living far away from our family. The families may still be in a rural, you know, the home seat, and now we're living in the cities, but grandma and grandpa are still living on the farm, that sort of thing. So there's this feeling of travel uh, that we need to go back to find our roots. And we're not just going back to a place, we're also going back to a place in our mind of this age where Christmas was, where the world was better. That's a very nostalgic vision. The world was better. It was the way, you know, Christmas was in eight, in Bracebridge Hall or in the old Curiosity Shop or wherever Dickens was, you know, setting his images. Um, the next one. Okay, the last coda. So what, so how do we get Santa Claus? <laughs> this is probably like in some ways the most mind blowing of all uh, iconographies and studies. So here's St. Nicholas, the real St. Nicholas on the left. Um, he is from Asia Minor, Nicholas of Mur, I guess it is, Asia Minor, of, around the year 400, I believe. Um, he then, his relics are stolen in the 11th century and taken to Bari. So if you ever go to Bari, Italy, there's St. Nicola in Bari, which is actually a Romanist church that has 
now claims to have his relics. So that's how he gets introduced from the Eastern Orthodox world to the Catholic Roman Catholic world. And it is this fellow on the left who's so stern looking, who turns into uh, or is turned into Santa Claus. Um, so let's go on and do a bit with that. So what happens? Well, we think of Santa Claus as being this figure from time immemorial, but he really is a re relatively recent creation. And so we're looking at this 1838 painting of St. Nicholas. He's starting to sort of, he doesn't really look like Santa Claus. He's this impish little kind of scary dude, actually, kind of youthful, kind of small. He's got the robe and he's got a sack. Well, and he's coming out of the chimney. Not really clear what's going on here. But St. Nicholas, as a saint, was an interesting figure. He came to the rescue of certain people. He looked out for children. He brought gifts. He, his One of his foundational stories his, in his hagiography was that there was a widower who had three daughters and he had no money. And he was afraid that, you know, no money, they're going to end up prostitutes or God knows what's going to happen to him. And Nicholas heard his plea and he came and he um, put, you know, he, I don't know if he came down the chimney or he dropped money down the chimney. But anyway, there are a lot of these elements that sort of get later picked up, but he rescues them. He did a lot of rescuing and he brought presents and he was rather, he was a bit judgmental. So good children would get stuff and bad children would get a switch or something like that. So in a way that's like Santa Claus. Now, saints are not celebrated on their birthdays. That was another objection some people had for, uh, to Christmas. That was not a Puritan objection because we don't really know when the birthday of Christ was. But <clears throat> Nicholas, death date, saints are worshiped on their obits, on their death dates, and it was December 6th. So December 6th is wintry, it's dark, it's sort of around the same time. And they start getting closer, you know, at some point there's an amalgamation there. So he kind of is acceptable for that reason. He's acceptable for his tendency to reward children, to look out for the underdog, to, um, oh, he is a bishop. And that's why he has the red and white robes. You'll see Santa gets more of a red and white robe. But this is sort of what St. Nicholas, who was not called Santa Claus yet, uh, looked like in 1838. I'll have the next one. Of course, Clement Clark Moore, if one believes that he actually wrote The Night Before Christmas, some people say it was somebody else. There's like this, this whole group of dissenters who say it was another person and he stole it. I don't know. But Clement Clark Moore became uh, one of the people who helped create the modern Santa Claus. And you can take the next slide, please. Because of course he wrote this, A Visit from St. Nicholas was the night before Christmas went all through the house. So let's look at the iconography here. Stockings hung by the chimney. St. Nicholas is gonna come down the chimney. The children are sleeping. They're having this vision of great stuff. Now we called it sugar plums. It's sugar plums there. Now as the country gets wealthier and wealthier, it's more than sugar plums, right? Mama's there and the, so the old people have settled down for a w winter's nap and then suddenly, what do you hear? So, uh, let's see, uh, a miniature sleigh with eight tiny reindeer, a little old driver, so lively and quick. I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. That's to he just made all this stuff up. So all of this stuff about the reindeer, the sleigh, you know, there are certain elements that came from various folklore, but he made that up. I'll have the next one, which is not the entire poem. I cut out half of it, but he said, comes down the chimneys dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. Okay, this is where the, this is where we have to pay attention because this is really a good primary source. If such, if you can have a primary source about a guy who we think was alive in 400 in Asia Minor. But in any case, his eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry, his cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth and the smoke, it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly. 
that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf. And I laughed then I saw him in spite, when I saw him in spite of myself. Okay, can we have the next one? All right, so that's really where our notion of Santa Claus comes from, 19th century, mid 19th century. And it gets an injection. There were a bunch of these guys in New York called the Knickerbocker Club. That's where the New York Knicks come from. Irving was part of it. Um, and they all start trying to create this Christmas imagery and Santa Claus. And it all helps when Nash, could I have the next one? Um, Thomas Nast, not Nash, Nast. Let's go back again. So that's where we end up, but I wanna show you how we get there. Tom, uh, Nast is famous for creating the um, donkey and the elephant for the two parties. He created an, a lot of, he was an illustrator who created a lot of American lore. I think Uncle Sam might've been Nast as well. So we're talking about a time when there were weekly uh, magazines like Harper's Weekly or Ladies Illustrated or the Godey's Book, and their covers are extremely influential and people read them, but the covers were done by all the great uh, illustrators of the time. Nast was one of them. And Nast from the beginning made Santa Claus and Christmas political. And we don't see it unless we look for it. So if you really look for it, you realize that he was a, he was born in Bavaria. He was a very strong unionist. He was very much against slavery. And he tried to imbue his Santa Claus with the union ideas. So this is one that I just showed uh, in 1863. So it's a soldier, a union soldier coming home. There's a Christmas tree on the table. There's, it says, welcome home. Um, the children are there. We have this guy right here. You can see him, it's hard. Santa Claus is coming, the two kids are sleeping. Santa Claus is coming with a big sack. I guess that's a chimney. He's going to give them presents. Um, the family gathers for a meal. This is Christmas 1863. Right, so Civil War time. And the children get their gifts. And here's where they're hanging up. They're finding stuff in their stockings. So it becomes a domestic, peaceful um, union, <laughs> uh, middle class uh, holiday, and Santa Claus is part of it. And he's starting to take on, as you can see in 1863, he's starting to take on some of the same characteristics that we see in the poem. And we'll take the next one, which is, all right, this is where the, the entire kind of iconography of Santa Claus comes together, except we have to be really careful at looking at it. And here it is in 1881. So the red and white robes come from Bishop's robes. So that's inherited from Bish, the, the history of the saint. Um, he's got his pipe. He's got holly in his hair, which is pagan, right? That's from the old days. But what about his knapsack? It's actually not a sack of toys. It's actually a military backpack. And he's also carrying the sword, and people who know more about this stuff than I do have said that this painting, or this illustration was done at a time in 1881 when the government, American government, wanted to cut the wages of soldiers and they were not supporting the soldiers. So Nast made Santa Claus into like a, you know, an American, a union. Uh, at this point, there's, everyone's joined, but he's still putting his, his, political stamp on who Santa Claus was and should be. Uh, I think it's fascinating. And that is pretty much the Santa that I think most of us, except for the fact that the backpack is a union backpack, but he's carrying toys, he's offering toys, he's got the pipe, he's got the sparkling eyes, he's rotund, uh, he's red and white. We don't see the reindeer, but we know that he's got reindeer parked out front. All right, so I'll take the next one. And this, just all enforces this kind of domestic image of what a proper Christmas should be, where there's a fam full family, beautifully dressed children, well-behaved, a tree in the background, uh, domestic tran tranquility and prosperity. I'll take the next one. And I'm just gonna end, you know, end by showing, you know, how Santa gets co-opted. You know, we have J.C. Landecker, who was, I believe, the teacher, one of the teachers, or like a slightly ahead of Norman Rockwell, but we start to see Santa on covers of magazines, and it is still the same Santa with 
either the hat and the heather or just the hat, the beard, the red face, the red and white clothing, bringing gifts. Um, I don't see the sleigh, but you know, he's he's got, he maybe he's on the back of the sleigh here and he becomes now not political, but becomes really a commercial, mar a marketing tool as Christmas itself becomes much more commercial. And another one, uh, and here, Norman Rockwell, the exa exhausted Santa, one of his many covers, I think he did 30 something covers with uh, the Saturday Evening Post that had Christmas stories. And the famous Haddon Sunblum, who lived to 1976, who made many, many pictures of Santa with a Coke. So Santa himself became an advertising icon for Coca-Cola. And that's a real trans, trans uh, uh, you know, a, a really tran, uh, a transcendent image. I don't even want to say that. That's not the right way of saying it, but it's really a transformation of, you know, this, this saint who I guess brought good things to Santa, who was bringing right, good things with Coca-Cola, uh, something refreshing. It's, you know, only in America could this kind of transformation go, but I think that's, I think that's my last one. So I'll just take one more. Oh, we can keep going. Just no, one more. So this is kind of the end where it's still this notion of a family oriented holiday, domestic, you know, expectation, a holiday for children, a holiday where people come to from far away to be with their family and all generations getting together. That that never changed. So that is what, and that's an iconography that is established well. Uh, especially in Norman Rockwell. So thank you. Thank you very much. I think I even said thank you in red and green on the last slide, but oh yeah, the last, thanks. The last slide actually has three books that if you like to read about this sort of American holidays, um, these three books are, you know, they're easy to get inexpensive copies on ABE or whatever internet provider you like, but they're all full of information then, just mind-blowing information. Carol Ann Marling uh, really was, uh, I don't know if she's, I think she's still living, but she taught at Minnesota and she just, she studied American culture, like parade floats. She studied, and it sounds silly until you read how she puts it all together with the history. She's, her book, Mary Christmas is remarkable. Stephen Nissenbaugh probably is the most serious story about the battle for Christmas and how Christmas went from being, you know, rejected by the Puritans to embraced by American society. And Penn Restat is, is just a shorter version of sort of the general survey, also very good, um, but all three, you know, worth reading. I relied on them heavily as I prepared this, but thank you. Thank questions? You. Happy to questions. You're overwhelmed. <laughs> Thanks. No, it's... I didn't realize how much, you know, when I start working, I'm like, wow, I, I could do this 10 times and say something different each time. I have never seen that three great painting before. That's amazing. Oh, that, yeah. The, the church and fall up and that, that, that's strong to me. Is it famous? I yeah, it's pretty famous, but, you know, yeah, I remember seeing it, but when they study, you know, it gets thrown in with these German painters of the 19th century and then sometimes blended in with American landscape painting that does this kind of luminism where you're like, you're almost getting a religious feeling by looking at these paintings. Well, the amazing thing is the man from the way scratches, it's a tiny part of it. I didn't even see large, it. Yeah. And the large part is the, the, the tree, the nature, the church. And who's to say that the miracle was I, you know, I didn't notice that that until I was preparing. I had seen the painting before, I never noticed it, and I was like, "Wow, there's somebody." Because to me, what I was looking at was the equating of the tall trees with the, you know, they called them the cathedrals, right? Mm -hmm. To this vision of nature and the church, like what is the difference? And it's both, you know, they're both sanctifying, you know, God in some way. And, and then I thought, oh wait, but there's a guy there, and then there's a crucifixion, and he's got his crutches. And well, I remember the first time I saw Rick was. I literally felt like this first time in my life I've really been in church. Yeah. No, people <laughs> called them ca the cathedrals. Yeah. Amazing. And so to be dwarfed. Was, that's beautiful. I've never seen well, now you have to. I'm, we probably have a book in the library about Caspar David Friedrich. Yeah, Friedrich, Friedrich, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. I don't know very much about it. I mean, you know, this was an opportunity for me to 
teach some things I have not taught for, I can't even tell you, 30 some, I mean, I taught medieval art and I taught survey of art history, but it's been years. So I've forgotten more than I remember, but it's fun to get back and look at it. Well, you know, some people are so in love with Christmas, secular Savior, the whole thing. I know. And for me, it just goes back to my childhood. It, it, from an early age, I just felt it was magical. Well, I think that that's what some of these things are playing on. And that's, you know, that's what's plugging into it. And that people have said, looking at Washington Irving's writings about Bracebridge Hall, that that never happened. Meaning that he had created some of this, like this cold, cold, it was became a, an invented tradition. You know, the idea of an invented tradition, like the kilts and things like uh, the, um, the 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 tartans, which was never, it never really happened. And it, but it was then invented in the 19th century. So there are a lot of invented traditions, but people bought it because they were looking for something. They had been displaced from their old countries. They had been displaced from the Civil War. Right? They've been displaced from rural life into these city lives where, you know, the husband had to leave for work and yeah. the mother, you know, I mean, everything had changed so rapidly. So Christmas presented this moment. And so does Thanksgiving, this well, chance to go back. Yeah, the warm love and the father figure to love you. Yeah, nostalgia yeah. and maybe some good presents too. Right? <laughs> yes. um, I, I know you, you, you said it's a long story, but in a tiny nutshell, how did they, they um, settle on December 25th? Okay, well, there are different debates about it, but I think one, first of all, there are two ways of looking at it. One, the winter solstice was at some places celebrated then, there were some pagan Saturnalia was December 25th, but really it became much more a question of by um, early Christian period, uh, they, Clement of Alexandria was the person who said, well, we don't know when it is, but you know, some people say this, some people say that. Slightly later, like fifth fifth century or so, when the church was becoming really established, um, there was the notion that Christ was crucified on his birthday. I mean, the day of his conception. Sorry, so not his birthday, day of his conception. So, so, and that was part of the divine plan, right? So, if you count, you get December twenty fifth. I mean, and I think the feast of the Annunciation is. March 25th. It depends. Like in the Eastern Church, Christmas is January 6th because they have a different calendar. Uh, the Armenians too, January 6th. But the idea was that to develop the date of Christian, Christ, uh, Christmas Day, the birthday, by working back from the crucifixion. But the crucifixion was based on when Passover was. So, I mean, it all becomes this whole calendrical thing. But that was how they established it. Because, And people would say, well, you look at the text and it says, well, they were with their flocks. So does that mean that they were the flocks were inside or out? You know, and they're trying to figure out what time of year it was. They saw a star. Well, the clouds would they've seen? Yeah. I mean, the, the Bible doesn't give you that kind of information. So they had to do it. That's how it was done, and then it was set from then on. Well, we're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so did you um, point out presents on the tree? Because Michelle and I always are irritated by "I'll be home for Christmas." <laughs> Oh, wait. The wine and yeah. the presents on the tree. Yeah, like, you can't put the presents on the tree. Oh, okay. so the presents on the tree? No. But they did. Uh -huh. They did. Because in those days, people didn't I have these. That song was from the 40s, so I, don't, I wonder when it was written. Yeah. The, I thought it was well, maybe it was still in their tradition. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, That's I, interesting. I, I, I didn't notice you emphasize that. I wonder if she's thinking about the song. Oh, and <laughs> some people say that candy canes have that shape because they would put it on the tree. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah. other people say it's to be like a bishop's crook. Oh, oh I always assume it was pretty Yeah, yeah. that yeah. makes sense too. Yeah. I mean, this these books, you're I'm reading them like it's amazing. Yeah, that, that was really good, Joel. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was fun. yeah, thanks. Experience.